Hey y'all, welcome to episode 5 of the Fly Oz Backcountry Training Series. At this point, we're moving on from basic backcountry takeoff and landing techniques and starting to study the mystical art of not hitting stuff, with a focus on approach techniques. As we venture further into the Ozarks, it becomes rarer and rarer that a backcountry strip can accommodate a normal pattern or a standard approach to landing. Sometimes terrain is our limiting factor, sometimes it's trees, and sometimes the strip just doesn't go straight. More often than not, the problem is a combination of all three, and we have to design our own offset or steep approach because a textbook rectangular pattern to land just flat out doesn't work. This time around, we'll also be introducing another great Ozark strip and fantastic smallmouth fishing destination, McAllister's Air Park, and working on the offset approach technique. So let's identify the risks facing us in an offset approach and discuss how proper technique and planning can mitigate each of them. Our first risk factor is the potential for a low altitude accelerated stall. There are a number of steps we can take to mitigate this risk, but first we need to understand the variables at play when an accelerated stall occurs, starting with load factor. Load factor, which is typically expressed using the term G, is basically just the sum of the lift being produced by the aircraft divided by its weight. Assuming level flight, an aircraft experiences higher load factor as it pulls through a banked turn. Without getting too far into the weeds, this is important to us because an increase in load factor raises the airspeed at which the wing reaches its critical angle of attack, thereby putting us in danger of accelerated stall as we maneuver through our offset approach low to the ground. This can be easier to understand if we just see it in action. This is a series of level stalls in the landing configuration at altitude, demonstrating the difference in stall speed between 15, 30, and 45 degrees of bank. As our bank increases, and thus so does the load factor, our wing reaches its critical angle of attack at a higher and higher airspeed, until at 45 degrees, the wing is stalling about 8 knots faster than it was at 15 degrees. So for every 15 degree increase in bank, we have a pretty appreciable increase in stall speed. But note that this only applies for level flight. For example, a canyon turn works because the wing is basically unloaded for the last half of the maneuver. If the airplane is allowed to descend, the load factor does not increase, and therefore the stall speed does not increase either. The exciting way to shoot the gap here at Sugar Creek is at a sharp angle to the tree line, and for some people this might initially feel safer because you're farther from the trees to the south. But this is far less effective and puts you at a much higher risk of accelerated stall than hugging the tree line and making a nice gentle turn through the gap. So let's take this concept out to McAllister's Air Park and put it to work. The more challenging direction to land at McAllister's is southbound, since you have to either go over the top of or inside of a bluff line along the river. One of the most common errors I see at this particular airstrip is a tendency to stay way too far from the bluff line and force a very tight radius 180. It's better in this situation to fly closer to the terrain and by doing so, widen your turn radius and reduce the amount of bank required. So here's a quick clip of that exact approach playing out. Now this one I'm not super proud of, not because of the lateral path taken to the runway, but there are two big ways I could have done this better. You're probably noticing the first one right about now. There's a difference between a proper spot landing approach with a level wing and stable descent and a nearly level approach where we're hanging on the prop. If we're dragging it in, we're further loading the wing and pitting ourselves not just against the sometimes necessary danger of a slow approach, but also against gravity in the event anything goes wrong. This is a much better done example, landing west through the valley at Sugar Creek. If we maintain a nice stabilized gentle descent to the runway, we load our wing less than if we were flying a level approach, and we run a much lower risk of getting way under speed. Now that's not to say there's never an occasion where you might need to drag it. We'll cover some approaches later in this series that have no go-around option. In this scenario, the greater risk may tip towards having any excess altitude. But at most strips, a go-around remains an option if you can't get down. Let's head back to McAllister's once more to identify the second problem with my approach. This is one of those basic flying principles that's ingrained into your skull during some of your very first flight lessons, but it's surprisingly easy to screw up when it feels like there isn't much room. Did you catch it? Let's check out the cockpit view and it'll be more clear. Pay attention to the ball on the turn coordinator through this turn. Also pay attention to where my ailerons go. Oof, somebody's right foot is getting a little bit heavy there. This is one of those things that's almost embarrassing to show because it's such basic stick and rudder. 
but it's surprisingly easy to find yourself skidding the turn when you're slow and feel the need to tighten things up, even though you and I definitely know better. We could spend lots of time discussing why exactly a skid is bad and a slip is okay, but the gist of it is that if you were to stall during the turn, the inside wing will drop in a skid, leading to a low altitude spin. But in a slip, the outside wing will drop, which will level the aircraft and actually coordinate the turn. So make a conscious effort to maintain either coordination or a slip during the approach as necessary. If you catch yourself getting a heavy foot, release that rudder pressure, release the cross-controlled aileron, and if you aren't too slow or the approach compromised, add the appropriate bank to hit your targeted turn radius. And as always, if there's even marginal doubt, punch it, go around, come back and try again. Our final risk factor for this topic is CFIT, or controlled flight into terrain. This usually happens due to either, one, the pilot attempting an approach that either they or the aircraft cannot successfully complete, two, lack of planning for the balked approach, or three, not properly planning for the wind conditions at the field. All three of these reasons for CFIT can be avoided by some due diligence before the actual approach. Overfly unfamiliar routes a number of times before committing, starting high and going lower each pass. Make sure that you have a plan for your approach and always have an escape plan for if it doesn't go smoothly. Brief this escape plan just like you would the missed approach procedure for an ILS or instrument approach. If I have to abort during the turn or over the runway, what will I do in each scenario? Our best defense to loss of control due to wind gusts is similar. Do a thorough recon of the area. Check wind with socks, trees, or dust at multiple areas on the runway and on the approach. Remember that when you're maneuvering through a slow turning approach, your flight control surfaces are only a fraction as powerful as they are at higher speeds. Also remember that a large enough gust can cause your load factor to increase high enough to generate a stall. If conditions are gusty and the strip long enough, consider flying a lower angle of attack on the approach to give yourself more buffer. If the strip is too short for any wind buffer speed and the wind is bad enough to make you worry about your ability to maintain control, it might be time to head home and come back another day. Better to be on the ground wishing you were flying than vice versa. To wrap up, let's quickly review our principles for offset approaches. Firstly, try to keep your turn angles minimized and fly wider approaches as possible to keep your load factor low. Additionally, try to fly a stabilized descent to the strip instead of dragging it through the turn. As you make the turn, pay close attention to your footwork and don't allow a skid to creep in. Before you start the approach at all, pre-fly your route and your balked plans at altitude. Finally, do a thorough assessment of the wind in the area and compensate as necessary to avoid nasty surprises from gusts, downdrafts, or rotors. And if you're new to a strip, it's always wise to enlist the help of a qualified instructor who's been there before and who can point out potential hazards and help you plan your first time in. Thanks for joining us today. Whether you're a pilot looking for backcountry training, an aircraft owner looking for information on Ozark strips to fly into, or potentially looking to charter a flight into the backcountry, check out flyoz.com for more info. Our next video will continue in this vein and focus on steep approaches to landing before we move on to some techniques for assessing an off-airport landing area. We'll see you next time. Fly safe.